as I say, we're going to now go into some a couple of client showcases, which will illustrate some of the ways in which our customers are using um, the discovery module to get the most out of it. So um, the first of those will be Helen Slaney, who is the Senior Coordinator Scholarly Publications at La Trobe University. Hello, Helen. Um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I think you should be able to share your screen if you go ahead and do that. Lovely, and uh, then take it away. Thanks so much, Natalie. Thanks uh, for inviting me along uh, to talk about our experience with implementing Discovery, which we did at La Trobe earlier this year. So what I've been asked to talk to specifically is how we introduced Discovery to our users and how we involved them in the rollout. So just to give you a little bit of background, because I think we were maybe a little bit unusual in how we adopted Discovery and the reasons why we took it up. So it actually formed the final stage of a larger project, uh, creating a one-stop researcher interface uh, from scratch. This was a, a bespoke build. Um, so this involved uh, grants, ethics, publications, any kind of project-based work that researchers would be involved with at La Trobe. Uh, and the final stage of it was academic profiles. So the Prime team were already taking an agile approach to product development. Uh, so there was already this, this built-in aspect of user consultation throughout and design thinking and there's these iterations and back and forth. So the user base were already heavily involved in the Prime project by the time we got to Discovery. Discovery was replacing a former profile system. We were using Vivo to open source uh, profiles. So it wasn't heavily configurable. There wasn't a great deal of support. Um, this was only, Vivo was only ever intended to be an interim system uh, until Prime was implemented, until we could, we could move forward with a more permanent profile solution. So we had the option of building a profile system from scratch. Uh, there were a couple of other options that we were considering, but Discovery was the best one to go with overall. And this was because we already had the existing Symplectic license for use elements. Uh, so it made sense just to add the, the extra module in. Um, it was easy, it was going to be easy to configure, relatively easy to configure. A lot of the features we needed came with it straight out of the box. Ongoing support was available, which we didn't have with Vivo. Uh, and it responded to a lot of the features that we were getting requests for most frequently from users. So real-time editing of profiles was a big one. Uh, previously, it took a couple of days for a change you made in your profile to show up in Vivo, and now it could show up in a couple of minutes. Additional professional activities were available. It's a lot more flexible. Uh, so we thought, okay, this, this is going to be the best one to go with. And the I think the most... Uh, the, the most important feature that it came with was interoperability. So it was not only was it going to be interoperable with Prime, um, with existing um, symplectic products with, with elements, uh, but also with our institutional repository. And we've just started using Figshare as of last year as our IR. Uh, so the fact that it had that straight on, that flow through straight from profiles to the repository, really, really valuable for us. So that's why we decided to take it up. So I'm just trying to move the slide on. Uh, okay, so to give you an idea of the preparation pre-launch, there's a pre-rollout. We, we had a focus group which met fortnightly for two months prior to rollout. So this was between January and March of this year. It was nominally composed of 42 members. Uh, so these uh, comprised some senior academic representatives and some other key stakeholders from around the university. So graduate research school, the research office, information services, anyone who would have a stake in how academic profiles were configured, what they ought to be used for, who, anyone who would have an opinion was consulted. Um, in practice, only three or four members ever actually attended the meetings but we pre-circulated slides in advance to this, this wider group to say, this is what's going to be discussed at the meetings. If you're interested, please come along and please let us know what you think. So we, we usually had the core team, technical, technical team, uh, and three or four others who were, who were involved in these fortnightly meetings. 
The technical team would uh, present configuration decisions that needed to be made uh, at, at that point in, um, in the rollout. And we took a vote or usually went for consensus. So if there was still a lot of dissent in the room about whether or not we should be going in one direction or another, uh, we carried it forward to the next meeting because we did have a couple of months to, to make these decisions. So it's a fairly relaxed schedule. Uh, for example, which professional activities would we want to introduce, etc. Most of these decisions, most of the decisions which were taken in the focus group were relatively trivial. Okay, relatively trivial. They needed to be made. They could have been made very easily by the technical team saying, right, we're going to go in this direction. This is what we're going to put out to you. And I don't think we would have met with a great deal of opposition. Uh, so, for example, spending, I'll, I'll show you a couple in a minute, but uh, a lot of discussion about whether we wanted uh, what Nick just called the, the hero bar, that side panel, to be black or red or grey. And, and the amount of uh, energy and enthusiasm that was expended on making, making this decision. Um, well, it's, I think it's, it's quite, quite extraordinary. So the, these, all these decisions went to this, this little committee. Our discussion was really animated. Uh, and that, I think, was really key to ensuring user, uh, user buy-in, user interest. People got very invested right, in the decisions that they'd made, that they'd become responsible for. Uh, so it very much involved the user base or representatives from their user base in these decisions and particularly ensured buy-in at senior level. So because we had these professors in the room, uh, they were then able to go back to the departments uh, and make it known that these were the decisions that had been taken. So I'll just show you a couple of examples. Uh, what order were the publications going to appear in? Uh, originally they were alphabetical, uh, sorry, originally they were, they were ordered by uh, most popular or most frequently used, right? So journal articles appear at the top of the list. Did we want to change it to alphabetical order? And there was a week where we spent a lot of discussion making this decision. Uh, which professional activities did we want to introduce? Uh, and this generated a lot of discussion about the precise definition of these activities. What definitions are we going to use? How is a committee membership different from another type of membership? Uh, what happened, what's the difference between a postdoctoral fellowship and a fellowship which is a membership of a learned society and is that actually a type of membership? So we had this granular discussion, but again, it created, it created buy-in and, it, and it, create, it became of concern to the members of our user group. So this is the kind of thing that went on in, in these focus group meetings. Uh, and then we came to launch. So there's already a lot of awareness in the user community that we are moving to discovery, right? We are moving to this new profiles platform. Um, you, will, you will need to learn how to use it. It's going to look, uh, the uh, update, how to update your profile is, is the same. It's still through elements, uh, but it's going to have a different end result. It's going to look, this, this is going to be uh, how it will appear to, to an external audience. Uh, so communications went out via various channels. Very importantly, we involved the research partnerships team, so research support team so they received training in how to be the the first line of contact so when users came in they were going to be contacting research partnerships so we had to ensure that they were absolutely across all of the changes that have been made so they could answer questions uh, on the spot we held drop-in sessions uh, partnerships are also involved in developing the new user guides and frequently asked questions that could go onto our onto our library website uh, we offered one one-to-one -one support uh, with any, any users who wanted, uh, wanted to be taken through it individually. And we had to develop a, a trio system for queries. So which ones are, were just related to how to? Uh, how do I set my availability for? Uh, which ones, which inquiries were actually configuration requests? Um, I don't see uh, editor of a journal in there as a possible professional activity. Uh, what do you want me to do? Can you introduce it? So that then went back to the folk, back to members of the focus group. Are we allowed to introduce editor of a journal? Is that okay? Okay, right, we'll go ahead and do it. So again, these configurations could be done very easily, but because we wanted the goodwill, right, of this of, of the academic community, that was very much what that what that focus group was about. And then what, what queries were actually ones that needed to be referred either to the prime teams, so those would be anything to do with the integration, or back to symplectic technical support. Uh, so the launch, launch was a bit of a splash, right, because we'd done that build up in advance and, and been setting up at the academic community to say this, this is coming and it will be exciting uh, and you will love it. Okay. 
And then finally, aftercare. So this is absolutely important too. So it wasn't just that we launched discovery and then users were on their own. Um, success measures are obviously going to be profile uptake. Um, so we're keeping uh, monitoring this over the course of the year, and then we'll review it in six months and 12 months to see how profile use is tracking. So it's very helpful that we can do, we can keep an eye on that in, in elements. Uh, we've delivered training to specific groups. So directors of research, um, really, again, really important having that senior level knowledge uh, that, this, this is, that this is available. Also, you know, politically sensible, you don't want uh, someone to go to their director of research and then the director of research is put on the spot and isn't able to answer questions about the new profile system because they haven't been informed. So making sure that everything is, is top down. Graduate research students, really important cohort. Again, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, these are the new users. These are the ones who are going to be introduced to what is a profile for? What do you put on your academic profile in order to optimize your, your brand? How do you brand yourself right, as an academic? Uh, and importantly, a research education program. So making sure that this is folded into this regular program of workshops. Profiles is something now that's going to be coming up you know, every semester. The, uh, workshop on how to use profiles effectively. Uh, again, not just the, the how to, not just how do I add a thing, but really if you want to, to optimize your presentation, uh, how do you do that? The rhetoric of a profile. Uh, and ongoing technical support, of course, so the library teams, uh, prime support, uh, and of course, when we need to, we're able to refer queries back to, back to elements. So I want to say thanks to Nick, who was a tremendous help with our rollout. Uh, thanks to Leone and everyone at Elements. And uh, thanks for having me to speak today. Very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, we haven't had any questions in while you've been talking. Um, let's say it's because you've covered everything so thoroughly. <laughs> um, but uh, if anyone does have any um, that they want to pop in, um, I'll just give you a couple of minutes before we hand over to Liz and Mary at Lincoln University. Um, I can see Liz has popped on now. Um, and they are going to be talking about uh, how they've been utilizing the discovery module. Um, and just sort of say from a, from a personal perspective, um, as we do this slightly awkward segue, um, I'm I'm sort of a newbie at Symplectic, so it's it's really useful for me personally to to sort of see these different use cases and get more of a sense of everything that's happening. Um, haven't had any more questions come in while I vamped, so uh, <laughs> I think we'll we'll move on to Liz and Mary now. And again, thank you so much, Helen. Right. Hi. Mary, are you there? Yes, I'm here, but I can't give you a lovely picture of myself, I'm afraid. My camera is not working. <laughs> OK, well, um, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about how we've been using Discovery, which we've really enjoyed uh, bringing to Lincoln University. Um, Mary and I work together in the research management office. Um, we we look after elements and things linked to that. And I'll give you a bit of a story about how we got on to becoming in responsible for the researcher profiles. So I'll just share my screen. All right, is that working okay? Yeah, that's lovely, we can see, thanks. Great. Um, I'm, ours is a similar and yet different story from what Helen's just gone through. Um, just wanted to start though with letting you know a little bit about Lincoln. Um, we're the oldest agricultural teaching institution in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're a specialist university focusing on the relationship between land, food and ecosystems. And we're the smallest university in New Zealand, especially in terms of students. Um, we are actually smaller than some uh, high schools in the country. Uh, and in 2021, we ranked 15th for small universities globally. So being a small university, we have some different experiences, challenges and opportunities than perhaps larger institutions do. So why profiles? Um, this sort of started in when we finished our PBRF round in 2018. Uh, PBRF is the New Zealand equivalent of ERA or REF. It's our 
national tertiary education funding process and the assessment and funding of TEOs on the basis of performance. But uh, the difference for New Zealand is that it's done on an individual basis. So every single researcher at a tertiary education organisation has to submit to that. So we had this really up-to-date record of the research that was being done at Lincoln, um, which is pretty amazing research in a lot of areas. Um, we, we could see what their interests were, what their achievements were, but when we looked at the profiles that were available on our website, we just weren't getting that story at all. So this is an example of what we used to have. Um, so focus was very much on teaching. So we felt we needed to have a research focus we wanted to have consistency in style and content. Uh, the way these ones were managed was just with uh, the departmental administrators adding things into um, a hub. We wanted them to be updated because um, they might have been set up when somebody started and then never looked at again. Uh, we wanted them to be searchable because they were only searchable by name. So that's only helpful if you already know who's working here. But if you wanted to find somebody who's like specialising in climate change or in wine or in sport, you had no way of finding that information. And I'll just pass over to Mary now to talk about having decided we wanted an updated um, profiles, why we went to Discovery. Okay, we, we ended up with um, using elements because we already were using it very well. And and also that the staff were quite used to it. Um, it was a nice bit of purpose-built software. And when we started looking at it, it we realised that it would give us exactly what we wanted in our researcher profiles. We did like the look of it. Um, the fact that it had custom customization or brand um, was good for us, but it wasn't over the top. It, you know, we could do so much with it, but it... It did keep us within uh, quite a good design set of rules. So we, we didn't have to keep going back to people who wanted things changed all the time. Um, we wanted it to encourage more use of elements by academic staff, especially for putting in publication information. And by no means least, um, it was very affordable. So we had an interesting journey with discovery because when we first started doing it, we then discovered we needed to upgrade to element six and then we needed to move to hosting. So we kind of started and then we had to stop for a while while we moved to the whole hosting, which was a big project on its own, but well worth doing. Um, so when we actually got back to looking at discovery, it's a little similar to Helen's experience, but not exactly. Um, her, <laughs> I was laughing at her, uh, pro her focus group because that was about the size of about a quarter of our academic staff um, so we couldn't do it on that sort of level uh, what we did was we made a mock-up of what the discovery um, profiles would look like and we met with initially IT the library and the marketing departments as our initial kind of working group um, we also discuss what's important in a public profile with a cross-section of researchers uh, and we also worked with the research committee so we got their buy-in early on uh, and it was then that we sort of presented the proposal to senior management and they approved that and so we moved on and um, but expect the unexpected we had a few surprises along the way the first one was in terms of photos so it was agreed that we needed to update the photos when we launched our new profiles, um, as I, this meme that I found um, really sums up. You know, People had had their photo taken when they started at Lincoln. They were here 20 years later. Their um, public profile looked nothing like they did in person. But that was where the time and energy went on there's ongoing conversations about what color background should we have to the photos? Uh, should the photos be inside or outside? People wanted their own special individual photo holding a lamb or being in front of a mountain to reflect who they were as a researcher. Um, and honestly, some of the photos that we had and people were suggesting were such a mess that in the end, what we decided is that we, you know, we also had some people who said, you can't use my photo. You've got no right to do that. Um, we didn't want to have that battle. So in the end, we just decided we could set the rule on, this is what your profile photo will look like. 
we can't make you put a photo up there, but if you are going to put one, it has to be in this style. And we've been really happy with that. Because we're so small, we wanted a unified, you know, professional look to the photos, and we feel we got that in the end. Um, and everybody actually who ended up getting their photos updated were pretty happy with it. One strange little side effect of all of that was that the research office is now responsible for taking um, new staff, research staff photos, which I think is just one of the joys of a small university which uh, doesn't employ its own photographer. Another surprise we had was the debate over the availability filter. That was something in discovery that really appealed to us because we thought it gave a call to action. So you know, you could see straight away, is this a researcher who's interested in collaborating or is available to the media or is available um, to supervise? And what we actually heard back from some sections of um, senior management was, well, everybody should be available for everything. Other people argued that um, they might not want to be available for supervision, but if the right student came along, then they really would want to. Other people were, um, some managers didn't trust their staff to perhaps make the best decisions on what they would be responsible, could be available for. Uh, and yet others sort of were like, well, what's the point of having the system if you don't have a call to action with it? So in the end, we, um, we just decided we're going to run with this filter and we will review it and we will see what people think of it. We have went live uh, towards the end of last year, but not with all our research staff in the system at that stage. So far, there's been no complaints about that. So we'll do a full review later in the year, but it seems to be working quite well at the moment. We left it up to individual staff to decide whether they wanted to use that filter or not. Um, they didn't have to. Um, so engaging with researchers, we didn't engage with researchers so much in the focus groups of setting it up, but once we knew what we were doing with it, that's when we really engaged with them. And we needed their buy-in because we can't, we do not have the resources to maintain the profiles ourselves. So this is just some of the ways that we worked to get that um, buy-in with them. First of all, we didn't actually call it discovery. I was quite strict on stopping everybody calling it discovery. And that was because the researchers only ever work in their profile within elements. So I didn't want them to think it was yet another system. They really get annoyed of having just learned how to use one system when the system for this gets changed or changed and that. So very much it was like, it's elements, it's elements, it's elements. So discovery is just our working title and we know what it means. Uh, the other thing we really did to help them out, um, which again, I think you can only do with a small university, was we actually drafted their bios. So as I said at the start, we had all that PBRF. Um, basically, I just took their contextual summaries, took out the stuff that was specific to that uh, assessment exercise, and you were left pretty much straight away with a really nice little bio of, this is who I am, this is what I'm interested in doing. Uh, we also made the decision to go first person because we it's sort of a Lincoln style, we wanted to be approachable, and um, Lincoln's known for having you know a very high ratio of staff to students and that staff are always available. So we wanted to sort of continue that feeling. Um, I, we set a minimum amount of information that had to be in their bios before we went live with them. So that gets over the problem that Nick showed where you could go through and see that some aren't there. So I didn't, we didn't go overboard on that. We just sort of said, you have to have a bio because we have to see what you're doing. You have to have your fields of research. You have to have your publications, but that's going to happen automatically. If you're teaching, we have to have your teaching up there because that's a requirement of marketing. And we wanted the degrees because we felt being at a university, we needed to sort of see their progression of where they come there. Didn't seem to be any pushback on that. People were happy doing that. Uh, we created a template for the bios, sort of saying this is the information that you need. And for people who hadn't been through that PBRF, I sort of came up with a template of five questions they had to answer, and that became the basis of their bio. Uh, we tried to keep the bios really small. If um, anything, I would have liked to have had a character limit in there just so that we could people want to go to pages of information but so far they've been really good um, and we also provided some assistance so we sent out those templates people were able to put the information in send it back to us and we had some staff who did the inputting if people weren't comfortable doing it but then we also ran training sessions where people could bring that um, template along with them and just cut and paste and and update the system there 
We found training by department worked really well because you're getting like-minded people together. We had already got the support of the deans to make sure that people would attend the training. Um, but I think one of the biggest things was really was the what's in it for me and not that not being for us as administrators, but what was in it is this for the researchers because that was central to our internal communication and that they, they needed to see some benefit from it. And when they saw the results of their new profiles, they did see that. And as we started to go live, people would contact and go, I need my profile up now because they really liked the look of what they were seeing. We did produce a lot of uh, supporting material. Um, I did a lot of it in snapshots and uh, of small parts of the process and also a fuller guide of how to do it. We uh, have put all that material on the Elements homepage, help page, so people can access it whenever they want. I was really conscious of working from the point of view of the end user. So us as administrators and users of the system would see it in a different way, but we tried to just say, you know, if you want to go to do this, this is where you go. So all from how they will go into the system and use it. Um, some pros and cons. Uh, there was a time commitment to set it out well in an appropriate style for Lincoln. Um, we worked on this, you know, as a, pro as a project. So it was kind of like, a, this is our six months or may have been longer to do this. Um, and that worked really well because you needed to set up that time. Um, one thing we found that is we had never used the profile part of Elements before. So for a lot of people that was empty, but some people had found it and they'd gone in there and they had put in all sorts of information that wasn't necessarily appropriate to go public. So if we had just switched everybody on, it would not have been a good look for them or the university. Um, so we felt that by yeah taking that time, making them complete a template and come to a training, um, it did end up with a more professional result that everybody was happy with. Um, limited ability customized. So seeing this is such an affordable product, um, you can't do everything you might like to do with it. And we find that that was both a pro and a con. So, you know, we were able to customize some parts. You can customize the tabs, although the list of options is limited. We were able to get the bilingual um, headings put in, which was fantastic. Um, deciding which publications to automatically exclude from that public record was really useful. Um, and some of the other things we could work around, so like we came up with our own contribution uh, or professional activities sort of categories, and we were able to use custom fields to build those up to work for us. Other things we would put in a feature request for, um, but in some ways not having total customization is really helpful and doesn't waste a lot of time with people arguing over, should it be um, the headings be this size or that size, or should this page do this and everything. We were able to just at times say, sorry, can't do that. This is what we've got. Um, also like to say just the excellent support and setup. So the whole team was fantastic to work with, but especially Nick, who we had most contact with, um, he was very accommodating and meeting in times that worked for New Zealand. And, um, and we never felt like any questions were stupid. We always got a reply, whether it was a straight no, sorry, can't be done, which actually stops you wasting any more time on it. Or being told, oh, yeah, that will be coming in the next upgrade. Uh, being helped to find a solution or having some of it sort of, you know, we're seeing some of those features he's announcing now. Go, like, oh, yeah, we asked if you could do that for us. So that's been really good. Um, the designers especially were patient when we changed the photos and changed their footers to get it right. Um, the other thing I put under pros and cons is just how to keep the profiles up to date. We haven't got far enough along the system to see how this is going to work. We're planning to do maybe an annual sort of stock take. Uh, we also have working with the heads of the departments to build it into their annual performance assessment to sort of say, have you updated it? And we're going to use that PBRS cycle that I talked about right at the start, which is every six years, to be a thing of like, actually, is your story still relevant or do we need to change it? Um, so just finally, just getting the results. So this is what we had and this is the new look and we are very happy with it. It looks far more professional. It's consistent. The focus is on... Um, 
the research, the search function works really well. Each researcher has their own URL, which they are loving and they're liking to use. And some people are making a lot of use out of that. There's been absolutely no complaints as it went live. So we're taking that as a huge win. Um, and another really big win for us was that as these have gone out, people have added more and more of their publications and deposits in Elements. So that's been really useful for us to get more buy into Elements. Uh, but just before we finish with questions, I will pass back to Mary to just talk about our last few issues that came with being so successful. Yes, I'm afraid um, success breeds more work um, for us. We, we found that people loved it so much that they wanted to be to have a profile, even though they weren't actually academic staff. Or, so we had a lot of tutors and we had librarians, so professional staff. Um, but the system wasn't designed for them. So at the moment, we've um, put them off to the side, but that doesn't mean that we won't come back and sort something out for them. But if they actually did put their information in, they would pretty much only have one or possibly two tabs. So people have loved the look and they want to be out there, but we can't quite facilitate it at the moment. Um, we also had... Uh, graduate office from student services. They want to use it as an advertising product um, for research thesis titles and options and everything else that they could possibly send po um, possible um, students to, to have a look. So if they were interested in say sports medicine, um, then we would have in one of our professor's areas, he would have to write a area, um, sorry, a piece that would say who he was looking for and something, some information that would then guide the student on to contact him. So we are looking at it, but the system doesn't quite work for it yet. The other one that we've had is, could we have all our postgraduate students on the site? Um, and so that they could put all their profiles up, up as well as our researchers. Um, we are in further discussions about that, of course. And we were so good at getting the staff photos done for our over 300 staff that it is now our responsibility to do it for the whole university. And we actually have to get in a professional photographer four times a year um, to catch up new staff or staff who didn't like their photo in the first place. So I'm afraid what we ended up with was more work. <laughs> but as always, you know, it's good to have a challenge. I'm really but sorry about that aspect, personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. it started off um, as when we first started the project and we said photos, all of a sudden marketing was there going, yes, yes, we need you photos. <laughs> so we just ended up doing it for the whole university. So That's why I call the, the curse of competency yes. to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, amazing. Thank you so much, Liz and Mary, um, mm -hmm. and also to Helen before for taking the time today to present to us.